Well, welcome to the this our third webinar that the West London IWA branch has set up. Inland Waterway Association, very quickly, uh, if those, I'm sure everyone here knows about them, but just in case you don't, it's a national charity which was founded in 1946, so it's been around a while, and its main aims are for the restoration, retention and development of the inland waterways in the British Isles. Uh, we're always looking for new members. It's actual bargain to join, uh, quite a sociable bunch. And tonight we were looking to build on, and I looked it up, and we've already had three webinars uh, of which Mr. S Simmons was here, all of them, on basically the same topic, uh, which, is, which is either positive or negative, depending on your point of view. Uh, we had a webinar in December of 2020, another one in November of 2021, and we had one in February 2022, which was actually talking about the consultation, and it was a couple of weeks before the consultation actually closed. So I thought this was a really good time to get an update from Canal and River Trust, and who better to give that update than Matthew Simmons? Anyway, Matthew, you can introduce yourself much better than I can. So please, as they say, the floor, microphone, screen is all yours. Thank you very much, Roger. It's very nice to be invited back. Um, thank you very much. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Matthew Simmons. I'm the, well, I am currently the head of customer service support for the Canal and River Trust. I've been acting that role since June, but my substantial role is the national boating manager and I've done lots of work in London so um, that's why you've had me a few times to talk to you about London um, and and boating and the waterways in London so I'm going to share my screen hopefully and um, go through the presentation um, let me begin um, as Roger said we've spoken to you a few times about the London waterways and are very much focused on the issues related to boating. Um, and I'm very happy to talk boating and I will talk boating tonight, but I didn't want to repeat too much of what I've talked about before. So I've tried to expand on what we'll cover a little bit tonight. And as we're rapidly approaching Christmas, I thought I'd blatantly steal the theme of a Christmas carol and try and cover some of the past, the present and the future of the London waterways. So when it comes to the uh, future, I've obviously had to polish off my crystal ball, of course, but not everything in the future is known. But I'll try and talk about how we might manage the future of the canals in London and give examples of what we're doing to address some of the future challenges. So whether that's the issues around climate change, protecting heritage and environmental challenges, as well as the boating issues that we, we've got. So I'll start with the past. Um, as you will all know, I'm sure, um, the waterways as we know them in London are pretty new. You know, 230 years ago, they didn't even exist. And even when they did, they looked very different from today as these engravings show of Paddington Basin and the Paddington Arm when they were opened. I should add, if you haven't ever explored the Canal and River Trust online archive, I'd highly recommend it. There's a wealth of images and documents that you we're custodians of, and most of them are digital now. So you can view those. If you go onto our website and just search archive, you can um, browse for hours. I will add the warning that it's a bit of a rabbit hole. You could find you're in there for a long time because there's such a lot to, to look at. But the bucolic scenes from when the waterways opened didn't last long. They were obviously um, for commercial use. And so this shot from Little Venice of around 1901 just shows that double or triple mooring in central London is not a new phenomenon. There were plenty of boats then, but obviously for a very different purpose for, for freight use. And freight was predominant for a long time and right up to the middle of the 20th century, that was the primary use. And of course, we shouldn't forget there is still freight on the London waterways today. However, there's no doubt that London's waterways today are increasingly a place where people live. So the Lee from 1960 was freight, very few other boats. And now, of course, if you visit the Lee and other parts of London, you will see a lot of boats um, that are people's homes. So the areas that once had very few boats after the commercial freight 
declined are now being used by thousands of people to, to live on in London. But of course, we shouldn't forget that the waterways in London are increasingly a recreational resource for both land-based and waterborne activities, whether that's walking, cycling, on the towpaths or paddling on the water. We've seen a very large increase in those different uses as well in recent years, which is, of course, a huge positive showing how waterways can directly improve the lives and well-being of everybody. I just want to highlight a few figures and numbers just to emphasise how we're working to engage the wider communities in their local canals, whether that's taking part in taster activities on or beside the water, let's paddle events or let's walk events, or using the waterways as a resource for learning, getting schools involved in their curriculum, um, getting people involved with volunteering, which many of you I know are uh, both individual volunteers and corporate volunteers and partners as well. And of course, celebrating the canals with their local communities, with festivals um, around the waterways, which I'm very pleased to say that we've been able to do that again this year after the enforced COVID break of a couple of years. But of course, increased use of the waterways brings challenges, most acutely in terms of boating and the challenge of how we manage increasingly busy spaces and the tensions that can arise between different users is, is the biggest challenge for us. In terms of boats, we have great contrast between different areas where we've got permanent moorings, uh, where we sell the mooring space, like these um, in Little Venice, which are managed by waterside mooring. And then we have other areas where we have public 14-day moorings, where there's often huge demand for mooring space and the access to the public facilities. So it is very varied across London, but there are lots of boats everywhere. Most of the boats that we see out on the waterways in London are those without a home mooring. In central London areas like Broadway Market here, on the Regent's Canal were virtually empty 30 years ago and now they're full and that's clearly brought lots of benefits you know it's enlivened the water space it's created new waterway communities and it's brought a much younger uh, boater than we see anywhere else on our waterway network so just to I'm not going to bombard you with lots of figures but I just want to highlight a few tables we've shared these before but we've now done our 2022 national boat count as well so you can see that the change in boat numbers has been very rapid in london over the last 10 years in fact we can go back to 2010 which is slightly off this table and we only had 400 boats at home mooring in london then and you can see that has risen considerably to well over 2000 um, boats without home mooring we didn't do a national boat count fully in, in 2020 or at all in 2021 because of COVID. So we weren't really sure what was happening. There was lots of speculation that because of the pandemic, people were leaving London on their boats and we would see a decline in boat numbers. But we've carried out a full boat count this March and we have seen an increase, although slight, on the 2019 national boat counts for boats without a home mooring actually seen a slight decrease in the boats with home mooring but um, it hasn't uh, seen a rapid decline as perhaps some people thought might be the case and although we've seen boat numbers increase for all boats across London over the last 10 years or more those without home mooring is where the growth has been most uh, significant and when we look at the different areas of London it's in the it's in central and east London where we have that significant growth in boat numbers largely on the east that includes the River Lee the Limehouse Cut and the Hartford Union and partly that is as a result of those being classed as River Only waterways so River Only licenses where you can get the 40 percent discount off the license Obviously, for some people, that makes it more attractive. And the next busiest parts are central London around the Regents and Grand Union. West London is comparatively quieter, but 
given the developments happening in West London and the improved transport connections, that's likely to change, I expect, over the next few years. To put it in context with other parts of the country, um, we've now got more continuous cruiser boats on London's waterways than we have boats with a home mooring. And the number of continuous cruisers in London actually make up around a third of all the continuous cruiser boats on our network, even though the London waterways only account for about 5% of our 2,000 miles of waterways. So it's inevitable with lots of boats in a finite space, it's going to lead to some challenges. And now is more apparent in those challenges than in East London, and I'm talking to the West London branch, but uh, I just thought I'd share some of the images we see on the River Lee, uh, where boat numbers have grown more rapidly. So the ability to moor, the access to facilities, and the ability for everyone to navigate safely is a challenge. And for the Trust, it's increasingly a challenge of how we monitor and manage those boats without home mooring and ensure everyone complies with the rules, especially with the finite resources that we have. And we're increasingly having to manage tensions between different waterway users and those on or beside the towpath, whether it's boaters, rowers, anglers, uh, those who live on land or beside the waterways. Inevitably, in a busy space, you can get some tensions. But I think on the whole, we are trying to encourage a kind of space where it's a shared space for everyone to use the river and the land alongside. We've been trying to address some of these challenges for a long time. For example, in London, we first created the boating liaison role, manager role in 2013, and we've recruited towpath rangers. We have a boating and customer service manager. We've produced and been working towards implementing the London mooring strategy since 2018, and we've made progress on those things. But some of these challenges are harder to resolve and the numbers are not declining. They've increased over that time. So it is an ongoing um, uh, a job. That's probably why you've had me back to talk four times, I suspect. So how are we um, moving forward to address these and trying to manage the water space fairly and safely for everyone? And how do we respond to the growth in residential use and how do we address the significant management enforcement issues? I'll be honest and say we don't have all the answers yet, but just to highlight some of the, the level of the challenge we've got in London alone, nearly 40% of the unlicensed boat cases are in London. The next biggest region is 20%. Nearly 70% of all the continuous cruise enforcement cases where boats aren't moving far enough are in London. Again, a big difference to the next biggest region. And a third of the boats removed across our network are in London. So London is very much um, one of the biggest challenges for us in terms of how we manage the water space um, and remain so today. And alongside the challenges related to boating, we've got the challenge of preserving and maintaining this very historic network although we have to maintain the newer bits as well. So just one example here is the Manchester Road Bridge, the Blue Bridge over the entrance to West India Dock entrance. It's not an asset that most London boaters will be familiar with, unless perhaps you've got a, a Dutch naval vessel or a small cruise liner or a super yacht. Um, and I suspect most people wouldn't consider it a historic asset, but it was built in 1969, it's 50 years old, and over the next few years, we're going to have to spend two to three million pounds just refurbishing this asset. Um, and it's a very crucial bit of infrastructure for anyone who wants to get into Tower Hamlets because it, it carries most of the road traffic in there, as well as being the main entrance to the, the docks in West India Quay. So, you know, this is just one example of multiple challenges. And this is one of our newer assets that we have to manage. So that's a challenge for us. We also um, have the issues of making sure the waterways are for everyone. So I'm going to talk about some of the examples of how we're trying to engage communities in the waterways. We have the issue of supporting the transition to net zero emissions for boats to meet that legal target currently set for 2050 and how we, what our role is in helping support that. And then of course, we're responding 
to the pressures and the changes that we're seeing through climate change. So I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing to mitigate and adapt to climate change, which includes protecting and restoring the biodiversity by addressing things like the invasive weed species. So what could the future hold? As I said at the start, I should uh, um, put a, a health warning that I can't predict everything in the future, but I'm going to share some thoughts and some examples of what the future might hold for the London waterways, but no one's 100% certain of what that will be. But I'll start with the question of, of residential boating. And I must emphasise here that we don't have any specific plan or proposals, but I think everyone here who's familiar with London's waterways will probably accept that the use of the waterways for residential use is not going to change anytime soon. Certainly in central and eastern London, like here along the uh, Hartford Union by Victoria Park, there are established boating communities. Yes, they're not permanently mooring in the same way that people with a, a paid for mooring are moored all the time. But so it's not always the same boats moored there. They should be moving every 14 days and most do. But to anyone who uh, walks along the towpath, they probably don't appreciate that. They just see moored boats always moored on this, these sections of river. So we should think about how we manage these spaces differently, perhaps reflecting there are places that people want to live. I'm posing the question, I'm not making a proposal, but I'm interested in the thoughts of people here today about how we manage these very busy spaces that people clearly do want to, to live in on the water. Of course, to do that, we do need to better understand the, the views and who is living on the water. Um, so this year we have carried out our boater census for the first time. It ended, it closed at the end of October and we've had a good response rate, not 100%, but over 11,000 responses to our census across the country which is about just under a third of our voters and 22 percent of those responses did come from london so we will get a good insight into who are on boats in london that's one of the biggest surveys we've we've ever carried out um it's it's interesting to reflect that we had responses from both boaters with a home mooring and from a continuous cruiser and whether this is a fluke or just a fortuitous that pretty much married up with the split nationally across the country. The, the percentage uh, of how licenses are divided up is pretty much the, mirrors the same response rate we got from boats with a home mooring and continuous cruising boats. We asked people to tell us in the census a lot more about what they're using their boats for, who's living on their boats, where they have children, where they have pets, the sort of things that the normal census would establish to help us understand what what the boat's being used for but we did also ask some open questions about challenges that people face whether that's related to access to health care or getting financial support or benefits or um, whether it's to do with access to employment or education so we've had thousands of comments related to those and they will be an incredibly rich resource, but it's going to take us some time to, to go through all those comments and establish any trends or themes. So we're hoping that we'll publish a report early in 2023, certainly with the statistical information. It might take us a little bit longer to work through the different sections where we've got thousands of comments, but we're very keen that that is an open resource. So once it's published, it's available for others because we often get asked by local councils, by other partners, about what information there is about voters and frustrating as it is although voters are asked to complete the UK government census they are classed in the same category as people who live on caravans or mobile homes so it's impossible to extract any useful data from that just related to people who are on boats so that's why we've carried out our own bit of research so that will be a useful resource. Um, but how do we resource the cost of managing the numbers of boats in London that continue to rise? Um, you know, more boats does mean we get more license income, but that license income only covers 
around about a fifth of what we spend on managing and maintaining the waterways nationally. So as the rest of the income has to grow to improve that cost of managing and maintaining the waterways, and as everyone will be aware, our costs are going up as inflation has, has risen. We have a lot of pressure on the, the cost for our works, for our materials, our labour costs, all of that has risen. So that's a challenge. So we've talked about previously, we've introduced some pre-bookable charged short stay mooring. And the consultation I think Roger was referring to was talking about how we might, one of the options is to, to introduce more of that. We are still planning to introduce some more additional pre-book charge for short stay moorings in limited numbers across London. And that's something we'll be looking to, to bring in next year in a phased manner. And as I say, it's very limited. It's a very small sections of short stay pre-booked charge for mooring in addition to what we've got already in Little Venice at Rembrandt Gardens and at Paddington Basin. But the bigger question is, should we create more permanent moorings where people want to stay in London? Um, we don't have a lot of off-side spaces where we have access. We don't have uh, a lot of basins or uh, marina space that we can do that. So, you know, is it a question that we should look at more permanent moorings somewhere else, online perhaps? As I say, it's not that we have a proposal, but it is a question that I think um, we have to think about going forward to address the demand that there clearly is for people who want to live in London on boat. So that's a, a brief summary of boating, but I'm going to move on to some other areas. We obviously have to manage a very historic and old network with some wonderful rich assets which require constant care and attention to secure their future but we have finite resources and this essential work is inevitably more challenging not helped by the rising costs that i've just mentioned but where we can we still need to attract additional funding to help us maintain these resources and i've got a couple of examples of where we're, we're working to do that in London at the moment. So the first one is uh, the Dead Dog Basin Bridge in Camden. So this uh, very delicate raw iron balustrade bridge across the entrance to Dead Dog Basin was built in 1846. It's very well used. It's one of the busiest parts of our towpath with millions of people walking and cycling across this bridge every year. But recent inspections identified that the balustrade was weak, at risk of damage or failure. So we have to intervene to take work to restore and protect this bridge. And we've been able to secure funding from the People's Postcode Lottery to do that work. So that's bringing in additional resources that we're not having to take from our, uh, the money we get from other income sources uh, to specifically work on this, this bridge. It's a £530,000 10 week repair project, which will start in mid January. And it will unfortunately mean we have to close it temporarily to carry out the work. But by early spring, the bridge should be open again and restored and looking in fantastic shape. So it's one example of where we're trying to draw in external resources to try and protect and preserve some of these wonderful assets going forward. The other example. I wanted to highlight is the Hanwell flight. When the trust was formed, there were 10 of our assets that were on the National Heritage at Risk Register. Now, the good news is that nine of those are no longer on the Heritage at Risk Register because we have secured funding and restored them so that English Heritage or Historic England, sorry, have uh, taken them off that at risk register. There is only one asset still left on the register and it is the Hanwell flight. So we clearly need to do further work to secure this asset and protect it for the future and get it off that at-risk heritage. So we've been doing work in to, to manage that risk at the moment. So removing woody vegetation, um, improving day-to-day -day vegetation, but it is going to take some significant investment over the coming years to restore and protect the Hanwell flight. We do have some works taking place this winter to replace the lock gates at lock 94. And if you're around this weekend on the 26th and 27th of November, there's actually an open day taking place at that lock. 
between 10 and 3 and you'd be very welcome to go along and have a look behind the scenes at the replacement of those lock gates. But longer term, we do need to secure a plan for more substantial work to restore the lock flight and to get it off the heritage at risk. That is very likely going to require multiple partners to come together to raise additional funds to perhaps generate additional income from other charitable sources so we can carry out that work. But it's very much a priority for us because we don't want to be in a situation where we have any assets on that National Heritage at Risk Register. Just moving on to a little bit about why, you know, we do all this work to maintain and restore the waterways and the wonderful canals that are in our care, is so that people can use them and enjoy them. We don't want them preserved in aspic. We want them to be living, thriving places where everyone can uh, benefit from them. And importantly, we want them to be enjoyed by the communities that they run through. And many of those most diverse communities are in London. Um, a great example of the work that we're doing in this field is to reach more diverse communities is here in West London, where the Trust with Ealing Council, Catalyst Housing Association and Ealing Council's Sport England National Lottery Fund Let's Go Southfield project, that's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it, uh, working together to transform the canal towpath the surrounding green spaces in Southall and improve improvements for the wider community to enjoy and provide opportunities for people to take part in activities, whether that's volunteering or getting on the water or being involved in other things that happen on or beside the waterway. We're delighted that we've been allocated a grant of £700,000 from the Mayor of London's Green and Resilient Spaces Fund to support this project over the next two years and we'll be working with the local community and those partners to really kind of engage local people in their local canal and um, and take a part in you know enjoying and caring for that space. Another example where we're very much working with the community is around the Brent Reservoir, also known as Welsh Harp. This has come on the back of a, of a less positive story where we felt we received lots of complaints about litter and debris in the water. And quite rightly, we've picked up on that because people value this green space in West London. And through that engagement, through that uh, negative outcome, we've actually been able to develop a project that works with the community, reconnecting people to the nature and being involved in helping improve and preserve the green space and the blue space around uh, Welsh Harp. So it's, it's going to be a multi-million pound project around £3,000 to kind of do everything we want. It's got multi-agency support because it touches on so many things, whether that's uh, health and well-being, active life, whether that's um, wildlife and an environment. So we have been working with that community to develop up a, a bid to the lottery and been invited by the local lottery team to apply. And this will be another 100% externally funded project from multiple sources. So again, bringing in additional resources to the London waterways um, on top of our, our, our budgets. So there's a few examples of how we're working to engage and work with the community. I just want to touch on climate change and the targets that we have to address to, to meet net zero by 2050. That's a legal requirement on everybody. So some of the targets have actually been brought forward by 2030, but for boats, it still remains 2050. And at the Trust, we're working on our own plan for the organisation to be net zero, how we reduce our emissions across the organisation. But that's got to involve what we can do to support voters, particularly to transition to net zero. Clearly, that is going to be a very big challenge. It's going to require more than just the trust. It's going to require stakeholders from the inland voting sector, from local national government to be involved. But we will play our part. And one of the examples will be probably the rollout of further electric bollards across London. We've done some examples in London at Islington where we have a pre-booked eco mooring zone, but there's also examples in Camden, which are just towpath bollards, which anyone can uh, moor alongside and use. And we're likely to see more of those over the coming years 
as we try and provide alternatives for people to rely on their engines or generators when they're moored up. Um, there's a wider debate about the future uh, fuels that will support most boats for propulsion. I don't have the answer for that right now, but we're very much working with colleagues in IWA and other boating organisations about looking at what those options might be in the future and what support is needed. But another example of where uh, climate change is having an impact on us is about maintaining and securing water for navigation. It's going to be a challenge. As we saw in some parts of the country this year, we've ex we're experiencing much warmer, drier, longer summers, making water resources more challenging. And I know you heard from Adam Comerford on another one of these webinars recently. So securing water for navigation could be helped by projects to secure drinking water for others. So transferring drinking water is not new used by the canals. We do it on the on the Gloucester Sharp Nest Canal, where half of the drinking water for Bristol comes from that canal. And uh, as water companies come under pressure as well to maintain their supplies, they're looking at other alternatives. Once they might have looked at new reservoirs or expensive infrastructure, but now the canals are very much an, a consideration as an option to move water. And the consultation is uh, taking place on a multi-million pound scheme to do just that on the Grand Union, um, where it brings water from the Midlands to the home counties, it'd be treated water, transferred via the canal. Now this has benefits for boaters and for navigation as well. So not only does it ensure that there is water in the canals, but to do that, to use the canal for this type of scheme, will need investment to upgrade and make those locks and other infrastructure resilient, and would also lead to other benefits, improvements to towpath and environmental improvements. So potentially it's a win-win scheme which actually supports and maintains navigation and helps protect the waterways. So we, we are very much engaged with other partners to see how we can utilise these um, mutual benefits. Another of the problems we have with uh, the changing pattern of our climate and the longer, warmer winter, uh, summers is weed growth. You know, many of you will know that we have challenges in London, particularly where we've got a longer growing season. So it's not just on weed on the on the water, but it's also grass and vegetation. So we're having to spend more on that. So on weed alone, we're spending nearly three quarters of a million pounds in London, the southeast, managing weed from the water, removing it. Um, but it is literally a growing problem with the, the changing climate. So traditionally, we would do this. We would scoop it out and we would put it to one side or dispose of it. Uh, without making making sure it doesn't re-enter the water where it just uh, becomes a, a growing problem again. But that's time consuming, it's costly, and it's just a continuous process we have to do. So we're looking to see if we can find new solutions that help tackle this issue. And we are trialing some of those more sustainable options in the West Midlands, where we're part of a trial uh, to test some biocontrol measures to tackle weed. and if, if this is successful, we hope to roll it out in different places. So there are different tests being carried out using a, a weevil to trial uh, it here on the pennywort, but we're also looking at uh, its use on water fern as well and working with partners to see how effective this is. So it's early, early days, 58% um, of the sites have had the trial complete and we have seen some promising results. So the, these pictures show, you know, that's quite a difference from before to after. But obviously, when you're introducing biological controls, you have to be very careful to make sure that uh, you're targeting the right things, you're not creating a problem. So we will have to evaluate these methods before we roll them out to other areas. But there is some hope on the horizon that, you know, that's one issue we might be able to uh, used to help us reduce the problem of weed on the London waterways and elsewhere. So I think I've been talking for about half an hour and it's a bit of a whistle top tour and as I said this would have been normally myself and Ros doing this presentation um, but I'm very much happy to answer questions. I can see there are some that have appeared in the Q&A but I haven't actually been able to read them yet so I'm going to stop sharing my screen 
and I'm very happy to take any questions or look at the questions that have come in and uh, see if there's anything I can answer there. Ah, okay. Matthew, thanks. That's um, interesting. I think is a, a word I would use, uh, a little bit of background, or quite a lot of background, perhaps. Uh, one of the things, because I as I watched the three webinars that uh, that you present, you took part on, which was part of the London region, the IWA earlier, uh, mainly so nobody else has to, but um, there you go. And some of the ones that you mentioned back in February, I thought you might sort of touch on. Uh, they were, and you slightly touched on long-term moorings, and... <laughs> I think people may be interested to know the consultation that closed back in April, which I think six, seven months ago, uh, whether there's been any 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 more thought on those, because I think you said at the time that was going to see if uh, what people's views on that. Yeah. You also mentioned back back in February about the penalty charge increase. Um, yeah. So and 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 then the pre bookable fee was too low and you were going to look at low, medium and high. Yeah. Um, I'll whip through these quickly because you you know them all. all right. There may be some people on here. Um, you did spend quite a bit of time talking, or Ros did, about the water safety zones, and uh, and you haven't mentioned them. But you, I did send you a question that we had pre-sent in that I can't type into the Q and A because <laughs> Zoom doesn't let me. So it would be great if you can sort of mention something and... about that. And yeah. uh, Lee Navigational Forum as well, Milton Keynes yeah. Moorings, Winter Work, and the smoke controlled areas you mentioned last right. time, but I, I should have I written these down. So you might have to prompt me again. Yeah, no, 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 that's all right. I, I haven't writ. Okay. But I so, see that all of London is in a smoke controlled area. But I think you said you were going to try, or CRT were going to try and sort of raise so, the awareness to people in London around yeah. smoke controlled areas. And finally, um, there was the pre bookable moorings. And I think there was a figure that you gave of about 10 it would only be about 10 percent of mooring space um when yeah. when are we i mean that's quite so, considerable but when are the proposals about that likely to see the light of day because I, I i've got a rough yeah. idea that a lot of people who joined the call today were, were looking for some information on that is that yeah. enough for you to go on with that's enough for me to go on i'm happy to deal with those points for you roger so start with pre-bookable mooring and the proposals we consulted on, which included increasing the, the or varying the rates of charges for those pre-bookable moorings, introducing more and uh, increasing the unauthorised mooring charge. And uh, there was one other thing which I've forgotten what it is, but we consulted on, but any uh, we did consult on those. We haven't published the results because we haven't had the person in place to do the work. So we are looking to publish those proposals and what we're going to take forward in the new year. We have been recruiting for a new boating liaison manager for London, and that person, when they're in place, will be helping take that bit of work forward. So rather than say, well, this is what you can do, and then there'll be a hiatus and nothing happening, we want to set that out with a timetable to explain what's going to happen. As I'm sort of alluded to, we aren't going to introduce everything at once. It will be a gradual thing. We'll be reviewing it so we see how they use how they used. But it, it so ultimately, I think what we consulted on was ten percent of mooring space could become pre-bookable and chargeable, but it's not going to happen in one go. It will be a much longer lead time. But we're looking to introduce some further ones from next summer. That's our intention. But as I say, in the new year is when we're looking to when we've got a new boating laser manager in post that we can. Um, we can announce more details on that. Uh, we did consult on additional uh, permanent mooring or the idea, what people thought about the idea of, of additional permanent moorings, maybe in the quieter, further out places. I think we were asking about West London, the Slough Arm, possibly Rice further up the, the River Lee. Um, the response to that was mixed. I think, as you'd expect, a lot of people don't want to see permanent moorings on line of the canal, but there was also interest and support from others. So I think before we have any sort of specific proposals, if we get that, we would have to do some more work to look at that. But it was one of the questions I posed in uh, the, the presentation. We know people are living on the waterways. They're not on permanent moorings. That problem is not going to go away. Should we think about actually creating mooring spaces that are more permanent? We do have some permanent online moorings in on the River Lee. There's some around East Wick, 
um, but we don't have many. Most of our permanent moorings tend to be in basins offline because traditionally people have not been keen on there being long lines of permanently moored boats permanently, but of course in London, that's precisely what we have. They're just not on permanent moorings. Um, so uh, remind me of another one of your questions, Roger. I didn't write them down. Water safety zone and the pre-submitted question. So the water safety zone, there was a pre-submitted question asking about why there is no mooring opposite the Hope and Anchor on what is a gentle bend and a wide section of the river. So with the water safety zone and all the proposals we looked at, we take into consideration the use of the waterway. And on the Lee, we do have lots of different uses. We've still got commercial craft operating. We've got lots of leisure craft, wide and small. We have rowing, we have lots of paddling activity. So the reason we created that section as no mooring was because we're trying to balance the needs of everybody and making sure it was safe. I think the question alluded to by having a no mooring section on what the person who asked the question um, thought was a very wide section, it's a gentle river, does that mean we will apply that to all other gentle, narrow, wide sections of waterway elsewhere? And the short answer is no, because we'd need to think about what the usage is of the river. We don't have all those mixed uses on every bit of our waterway, so we would look at the factors that affect that. But I did, um, I would also add that we have commissioned an independent organisation to produce a navigational risk assessment on our proposals. We're waiting for the response from them on that, and we'll be considering that before our next steps to try and work with stakeholders to improve the safety for everyone using the Lee, um, because I know there are strong views on each side of the argument and from different users, and we're trying to just improve things for everybody there. Yeah, no, that's 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 answered that one. There is a question in the Q&A from Iva. Um, yeah. You can read it as much as I can. It's uh, about five boat. companies. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's funny this I should I was looking uh, a little picture flashed up on Twitter earlier of a of a black print hire boat with what appeared to be tiller girls on the roof it was obviously some promotional activity from something like 1960 but looks it and I think black prints were the last hire boat operator in London before they withdrew so I I, I agree actually um with Ivor's sentiment that there is it's a shame there isn't a holiday hire base in London. Of course, we shouldn't forget there are still boats you can hire in London. We have go boats, which is a slightly different proposal. And um, but I, you know, it would be nice to encourage people to see London as a place that you could go with a holiday hire boat as well and have a base there. Um, I don't think we have that um likely to happen anytime soon, but you know, I agree it would be nice to see the hire boat return to London. Um, in terms of encouraging um, visitors, obviously things like the pre-book ball and giving reassurances that you can visit London do help. Earlier this year, there was a, some of you might have taken part in the, the trip organised for the Historic Narrowboat Club to London. They were there at Easter and uh, we're working with them to, promote, to do a piece on their experience of what it was like visiting London, because I think like many people, they had perhaps the worst expectation that they couldn't visit, they wouldn't find places to moor, that there would be a hostile environment for anyone who wasn't already established as a boater in London. And of course, that isn't what it's like. It's a very welcoming community. There was space to moor. They actually had not perfect, but a very favourable experience of visiting London. We want more people to experience that and to try visiting London on their boat. I mean, for, for um, reference to everyone who doesn't know the historic narrowboats moored up on the limehouse cut they did. um probably naughtily about three or four abreast but uh, i'm sure that the well, enforcement officers probably didn't go down there that anyway so moving it's, it's on funny you one, should it's funny you should mention that it wasn't actually on the limehouse cut that they were spotted mooring a little bit abreast it was somewhere else and i got a message but i knew whose boat it was so i, I gave them a quick call and they very politely uh, moved to their boat <laughs> There's a, a question I've been sent through the chat. Uh, just it's it's not particularly applicable to London, but it says all oh, somebody was shocked when they cruised the Staffs of Worcestershire Canal. One okay. meter high weeds on the towpath were deposited into the canals. Is that normal practice to 
I know a lot of grass ends up in the canal, but when when things are cut down, they end up in there, and it's yeah. It's not really your remit, I know. So, well, I think I can answer it because I mean, most people will be aware that we changed our grass cutting contractors this year, and it it did not go as smoothly a transition as we planned. Partly that was because when the contract moved from fountains to the new there was a couple of providers you have the transfer of staff process the 2p process where you they take on the old staff but of course the staff don't have to go if they don't want to so they did experience some teams of grass cutters moving and leaving so they were short staffed they got behind in some places in other examples the equipment that they were meant to be uh, have available to use wasn't adequate so we have had a lot of intense work addressing those issues with our new contractors things are starting to improve but i expect the example that's been cited there was probably earlier in the summer where we did have some backlog we did have some things that weren't acceptable um we've been working with that we're doing the edge to edge cut now and so by next spring i hope people will see a better grass cutting regime in 2023 than they experienced early in the summer so i can only apologize if you experienced that one, one thing which is slightly uh, along the same theme is with the new contractors who do the cutting, CRT, um, most people probably know, but CRT have a boating buddies scheme where members of staff can be taken out on, on private people's boats if they want, so they can see what it's like from a boater's point of view. Uh, I normally send my uh, itinerary to various people in CRT, but I think the words got round that I'm not the sort of person you'd want to spend many hours with. So we do we do have two people this year. But one of the suggestions I put forward, I think it was to uh, the Associated Waterways Cruising Clubs on one of their posts, is that I wondered if it was that was extended to contractors, because if contractors could see what it looks, what the visibility of bridge holes and the like is like from the back of a boat yeah. they might actually get a greater awareness of what's needed rather than doing everything from the towpath so i don't intend you to answer that in the next five seconds but it might be something that you might take <laughs> away so it's not just crt staff it's it's partners as i think the corporate term is no i think that's a good a good suggestion roger yeah i agree that would be beneficial they probably wouldn't want to come with me anyway there's <laughs> Roxana has got a question, which I'm sure you can read as well as I can. So if you'd like to go to that one. So I think the question is, is missing citing data of voters movement in London for two mates an intentional political action to apply unfair restricted licenses? So um, the short answer is no. I mean, we do have data checkers taking sightings, but our sightings data should be a, a minimum every 14 days and obviously boats move around and if the sightings take place when you've moved somewhere else or then you it's only ever going to be a partial picture um we do always say to boaters we encourage you to take your own keep your own log keep your own record so that if you think things have been missed you can you can provide that information and we can look at that so it's it's not a intentional issue an intentional decision uh we still do take boat sightings um we have had some instance this year where we've had to introduce no loan working in some places due to um behavior against some staff on our waterways I'm not saying that that's from boaters it's just unfortunately the world we're living in these days so that obviously has an impact on our resources and how many people can get out but we still do take boat sightings but as i say the people are encouraged to take keep a, a log of their own boat movements as well because that will only always be partial because i know that the um well i think in fact i'm sure i know that the mpta normally uh, recommends people who are continuous cruisers to take a log and maybe even a photograph um because sometimes things are, are not spotted and and that can clear up a lot of a lot of issues and and I do know because I've I've read and spoken to people who say that CRT are very understanding that things can sometimes go wrong, and so photographs with some from examples of where you yeah. were, whether it's credit card bills, it's like can be very useful uh, yeah. in clearing up some issues. So, so 
So uh, I mean, let's, let's Lisa. Rest. I think Lisa just asked a follow-up question whether that was a, a earlier. But what's the best way to log your movements? Well, there are lots of ways. But if you've got a, a you know a smart camera, a smartphone which can you know keep your GPS location on your photos, your G, uh, they call them geotag, is that what it's called on your photos, and it date stamps them. That's one easy way of recording your your boat movements and where you are. Um, but if you haven't got that, you know, write them down. If you can take photos, that's helpful. If you've got, you know, if you've got gone to buy fuel or or been in different locations, you, some people sometimes keep receipts as well. There's lots of different ways, but the simplest way is obviously taking a geo stamp time dated photographs is, is one way of your, of your boat in different places. I don't think it needs to be totally forensic. Just uh, just 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 an idea of where people are. Libby asked a question which is absolutely nothing to do with you, Matthew, really, although you did mention it because it's to do with the Hanwell flight. There was a partnership or this. There is a partnership between CRT and the IWA West London branch uh, that was actually looked to focus to help get it off the at risk register. I think it's just fair to say that there was some, let's say, communication breakdown as to exactly what the role of that partnership was to be whether it linked in with the let's go Southall scheme which Hamwell is a part of it and whether it was just sort of maintenance and and, and sort of looking to to get the the side pounds back into the thing there was a meeting two days ago or yesterday I think it was about that so hopefully that will uh, will get going again but as as with all these things there are an awful lot of uh, different ways of looking at things and if yeah. people are more in interested in knowing a little bit more about the the Southall scheme our first webinar that we did on the 22nd of September by Council Deirdre Costigan who was in the photograph that you had there that was actually it was very interesting a million pound scheme which actually includes some leveling up funding for Ealing I thought who knew that I just thought it was in the north of England but no there was some leveling up funding um, it's actually a very interesting uh, webinar and it's available on IWA's YouTube channel. And the webinar we had on that you mentioned about water resources, I've been promised that it's turning up on the YouTube channel tomorrow. And there was a very uh, in-depth, I'll say with a smile on my face, engineering type um, uh, talk by a man whose name I can't remember. Uh, which if you're an engineer would be really interesting and if you're not an engineer may be a little bit interesting um, and and so that hopefully should be there as well I can't see any more questions I think uh, there's, there's one from Ivor that sort of um it's not direct to London but it's whether you know play other places oh no, there might are. I haven't scrolled down sorry residential moorings um I suppose the answer is potentially yes there's there's lots of water space in London which might, you know, look at residential moorings. Interestingly, I'm I'm part of a, a working group that is in meeting virtually internationally um, for an organisation called PIANC, which is the International Federation for Waterborne Transport Association. And this is a, a interest in people wanting to live on the water, whether that's on boats or on more uh, conventional homes that float on the water is an issue that's being grow across the world across europe in america and japan and china as well so this working group is looking at you know what um things should be considered for people who want to live on the water and i'm playing a part in that in that group as well so it's quite interesting to know that it isn't just a uk issue um it's happening everywhere thank you thank you for that the work we did have a i West London branch meet, not branch meeting, committee meeting today, where we went through lots of the new developments that are uh, happening on the Paddington Arm. An unbelievable number of new developments that are having. It, it's just like quite startling. Uh, yeah. And the one we were talking about today is by the Prospect House, by the North Circular, only 23 stories. So that's, you know, not, not very big about yeah. whether the IWA could ask for possibly some residential moorings on the offside. Um, I mean, anything that CRT can do to support more residential moorings or more moorings mm. on the offside mm. for people to utilise, I think mm. would be useful, especially as the canal is reasonably wide at that point. Yeah. But it's just, 
it's the amount of accommodation uh, new development that's coming up especially in london and i'm sure in places like birmingham um, yeah. a a message from Roxana, perhaps perhaps she can email you um so i'll about... take that i'll follow that up with the license support team after the meeting so i will uh, follow that up for Roxana. i can't answer it myself but i'll certainly ask them to to make sure that they follow up her email and look at that for her um, that, then, that's great and i'm sure i'm sure if nothing comes of that she can email me as well um sure. just go to somebody else to get to paul has sent through a, a message about yeah. the recent consultation at paddington basin yeah. um i think there was some skepticism about how many wards may have been closed because of, of boat smoke there but uh, yeah. i know westminster council did consult on perhaps restricting uh, the use of engine stroke yeah. chimneys and that sort of uh, engine running at that point uh and yes there was a strange well, strange I'll... suggestion yes about electronic heating for 1400 quid per boat but uh, do you know if that's moved on at all are you in so I'll, i will answer, i will answer this but maybe i'll try and answer this as well in the wider context of air quality as well because it was one of the things that you read on your list and we forgot to to answer but um so earlier um this year the environment act was amended which meant that boats and crafts can fall within the air quality kind of regulations as well. Previously, they were sort of included, but the, the, the way they were measured was so bizarre and vague. So it was basically based on the color of the smoke or pollutant coming off a boat that you had to hold a color chart up, was not enforced by anybody, but they've now come into the legislation so that they can be enforced against for air quality pollution in the same way that buildings are however although that's incorporated into the environment act local authorities can't just retrospectively apply that if they have smoke control areas they have to amend to consult on those amendments before they can include boats into that now i've had various conversations with local authorities in different parts of the country who have explored this and i'm quite glad that most of them are recognizing that for boaters there is not a really a viable alternative for many people to heat their boats and it also there's a cost issue as well um so what they're mostly looking at is how they can educate and support boaters to try and reduce emissions and also you know the impact it has on the boats itself who are breathing in the particles which we now know are increasingly damaging for for you as well um now in paddington basin there are two particular mooring spots which unfortunately are very close to <laughs> The air conditioning for the hostel so it's really a location issue that's been the problem so yes westminster did a, a carry out consultation about whether potentially to create eco moorings and electric charging points in paddington basin they haven't got any funding to do that at the moment so it is an aspiration so in short answer are they are they progressing it not that i am aware of i know they are sort of uh, still in contact with us and they are keen to improve air quality but as i said we're also keen to make sure that it's as much about education uh, uh, rather than just using penalties to um to challenge boats and as, as paul has pointed out for most boats you know they haven't got the resources to adapt their boats to run electric heating so you know we have to be practical here you know it's part of that wider transition to address climate change if we want boats to be completely free of emissions then it's going to need support from the government i think um and we're still waiting for the government's response to the various consultations they have run on the clean maritime plan and the transition to net zero so i'm afraid i haven't got an answer from them yet so it's a watch this space it's a watch this probably space. closely yeah had another question sent to me which is it, it was about um it was about hire boat company that were utilizing areas that perhaps they shouldn't or hadn't paid for it was on a lock landing on the again it was the staff the worcestershire canal and also i was going to send it's not that personal and i didn't in the end because i thought it was petty uh but there was a certain boat hire company in the oxford canal uh, so it's in CRT London and the southeast, and they have 
uh, British waterways, no mooring signs put there. And so I moored there thinking these are very old until somebody from the other side said, you're not allowed to moor there, that's private mooring. And I thought, I bet it's not. You probably wouldn't be able to answer this or wouldn't want to, but I'm sure this does happen in, in parts. And But I, sometimes you think some people don't actually like other people taking advantage and it can work both ways, whether people do it nasty or that. So it's. do you think this is something that is like, people sort of say yes but they do it and um, i don't i think that's more rhetorical than anything else yeah, actually, I, don't know, I don't know the answer roger sorry for that one but no no i didn't i just i just thought i'd mention it so next time somebody uh you hear about this you can say oh i have heard that before what do we do without publicly answering something okay. tim lewis here's yeah. a good one for you that i'm sure you can find out about the I crt website into. lists a strip of land adjacent to commercial road commercial road block has been disposed of what is the reason for this i can give you two minutes if you want uh, surely it would interfere with future maintenance if there was the land to be built on now i didn't realize that the crt site listed land that's disposed of so yeah. that's actually quite interesting um or is that quite sad i think it may be sad um it's uh yeah it, it's so it's a good are you, are question you no, uh, so I'm not aware of this particular site, and so it's something I can again look into and try and get an answer back for you. Um, I mean, I know the principles of, of land ownership and disposal, so obviously most people will be aware that most of the land is owned in, in infrastructure trust, so you, we can't just dispose of land, especially stuff that is of relevance for operational use. So if there is any land that's being disposed of, there would have been quite a rigorous process to evaluate that. I don't know what this site is. I'm happy to go and look into it and try and get a, a response for you, which you can circulate after the meeting. Um, but I, I don't know it specifically. Sorry. If Ros had been here, she might have known about it, but I'm afraid it's not come across my radar. No, that's OK. Um, I'm sure Tim is well uh, able to chase people up as well. So um, but just to, I thought it was worth saying, because obviously there's a lot on i don't think crt's website is the easiest site to navigate shall i say uh polite well i have some good news there for you roger because there's been a lot of work going on this year to to we are upgrading our website i don't think it's going to happen until next year now but by the new financial year i hope you will see a new website and we've been doing certainly a lot of work in the boating sections of our website to redesign and reorder that to make it easy for you to navigate and you'll be able to link straight to some, to boating from our home page when the, the new site launches as well. So we've been trying to make it better and easier for people. So hold hold your finger, hold your breath, keep your fingers crossed. But I'm hoping by April we will have a new new website live, which will be better than our current one. No, I think as um, as sort of a, li a little bit of background for people, I, I go along to the boat, is it Boaters Disability Forum or Disability, whatever it is, that Stable CRT Boaters helped. Forum. That, that's the one. And I did raise the issue of uh, the state of, not the state of towpaths, but how do we know what the condition is a towpath? Because I couldn't yeah. find it on CRT's website. And I think you yourself, Matthew, said it's here. Uh, so it is there. But you know, anyone but who tries know, to find it. I know it's not as user friendly as we want it to be. And I think the web team, to be fair to them, know that too. And I have been doing a lot of work this year, which will pay off when it gets re upgraded next year. I was just going to say, finally, you said that is there a communications plan that you could make available to people for the pre bookable? moorings and whether there's going to be an increase in enforcement office which is which is going to be funded from increasing you know to, to have it, a rough all, idea that when... will all be out in the new year or in the yeah in the new year i can't give you a precise date because we're still in the recruitment process as i said to... no 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 that's all no i just wondered if there was a plan that sort of with a timetable with indicative dates and perhaps you'd like to do another webinar uh, almost to announce it, you know, exclusively for the Inland Waterways Association, of course. I'd be very happy to share it with you and to come back and talk to you about when we've got the details ready to, to release you. 
Somebody said CRT's website ought to be easier to um, navigate. navigate. It's very true. Yes. I think that was a. Is he going to get under? Are they going to get under there? Are they going to? I think so. Yes. I don't think we need Only to lift it for that. Only if they duck. <laughs> yeah, keep your head down. Okay, I'm not. Um, that's yes, we did fit, said Simon. All of a sudden, that photograph came up, and nothing else did. So uh, it yeah. was Neil Owen was the uh, CRT person who gave the who gave the uh, very detailed report. Engineer. And Neil so, is the uh, Neil was uh, uh, is involved in the work to that's going to need to be carried out on that that bridge in the photo as well. He's uh, one of our senior engineers. Senior engineers in, in this area. So one Hillingdon Boat Club is in Waterloo Road, Uxbridge, uh, which is opposite the General Elliott pub. And if you can find if you've not been there before and you can find it first time, you get a prize because uh, it, it's probably not the easiest thing to find. I think that's probably enough. Okay. More than enough, some people might say. So um, all, I, all I can say now is thank you for attending and hope to see you at a future webinar.